All right, we're gonna test our IT. Does Zoom, can we get some thumbs up on Zoom if you can hear us? We can hear you. You can hear us, all right. Thank you for your patience. We lost our Zoom folks. We lost, we, we dropped a bunch of folks. So I'm sorry if you got dropped from Zoom unexpectedly. We're glad to have you back. We are going to get our county council back to his seat again so that we can continue. All right, so I understand that um, we, we were dropped while Les Gerard was uh, speaking, so we'll have him restate his comments um, and then we can go out to public comment. The power of county council blows up the sound system. <laughs> so uh, thank you, honorable chair, members of the board. I just wanted to comment, uh, Dr. Moreno has uh, explained his authority and the basis upon which he can take action, and that's up to his discretion. However, I just wanted to point out that this board has similar discretion uh, for the safety of the public health, safety and welfare to consider the entire record, the current status of uh, COVID in Monterey County, uh, the potential for cases to rise or fall, various uh, variants that may come and may go. And so in my opinion, this board in its discretion may adopt a, a facial covering requirement countywide, notwithstanding uh, the fact that Dr. Moreno has declined to exercise his discretion under his separate authority at the present time. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for that clarification. We will take it out to public comment. For those of you who are joining us um, for the first time on public comment, we are um, we have a time limit of a minute and 30 seconds. We'll have a timer up. And I just respectively, uh, respectfully ask that you watch the timer so that I don't have to interrupt anyone. Um, I'll state your name. You'll need to manually unmute your microphone so that we can hear you. We'll start with a public comment in the audience first. So if you could just be prepared to um, approach the dais as soon as the uh, previous person is completed with our speaking. And this is for um, public comment on our uh, discussion about adopting a face covering mandate for Monterey County. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcella Ramirez and I am a county employee. I oppose a mask mandate. I applaud all of those who chose to not get vaccinated, those who did, those who chose to wear a mask and are still wearing it, those who didn't, those who have maintained their exercise and eating routines, and those who chose to sit on their couch and eat their comfort foods. Good for all of you. You should continue doing as you choose. This is not about opinions on vaccines or masks. It is about mandates that disregard freedom and self-accountability. I am responsible for my health and not you. I am responsible for assessing my own health and risks. A mandate is not required to make sound and wise choices. Common sense, good hygiene, a healthy lifestyle, natural immunity, diversity of thought, and above all, kindness and respect are the things that should be encouraged. Thank you. Thank you for your comments today. Is there any other public comment in the audience? Seeing no one approach the chambers, we'll move to our Zoom public comment. Um, we'll start with Karen, followed by Robin. Karen, we've given you permission to unmute your microphone, but you'll need to manually take that action on your side so that we can hear you. All right, let's move on to Robin. We'll circle back to Karen. Robin, we've given you permission to unmute. Thank you. The current surge has been called a pandemic of the unvaccinated, but the rising cases in children make it clear that this is also a pandemic of the innocent, specifically kids too young to be vaccinated. With Delta surge raging just as kids go back to school, pediatric hospitalizations in the US are spiking and some kids hospitals are already overwhelmed. In Monterey County, we're lucky and our surge so far is smaller, but hospitalizations here are rising too, including of children. Community cases are a strong driver of case rates in schools. No matter what schools do, if community spread is too high, outbreaks at schools are inevitable. At best, this means more missed school days or possibly closing in-person school altogether again. In the worst case, these outbreaks could lead to more children in the hospital or even deaths. As Dr. Moreno mentioned, cases in the Bay Area where there are mask mandates are dropping. County case rate data show that on average, counties that enacted mask mandates in early August have had no net increase in cases since August 1st, while cases grew nearly 60% in those that did not, including Monterey. 
Several peer-reviewed studies also show that mask mandates work to increase mask adherence, reduce hospitalization, and save lives. The science is also clear that the best time to implement these measures is early in a surge, to put the stop to the exponential growth of the virus before it's too late. And mask mandates are one of the least burdensome mitigation measures, certainly preferable to business or school closures. Thank you to the supervisors for your support of an indoor mask order to protect children throughout Monterey County, and please do follow through as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peltz, for your comments. Uh, Carolyn Swanson, we've got you up next, followed by Marilyn Golly. Thank you, Chair Root Askew. <clears throat> Good afternoon, supervisors and staff, including Dr. Moreno. Uh, thank you all for your work that you do for our county. I am Carolyn Swanson, an elected school board trustee from Pacific Grove Unified School District. I am here today as an individual, not representing my board, to respectfully show support for our county to consider instating a mask mandate for Monterey County. My colleague, Dr. Amanda Whitmire, an elected MPUSD trustee who's also acting as an individual, and I put together a joint letter and we circulate, circulated it to every city council member and school board trustee whose email we could find online this weekend. With this letter, we wanted to demonstrate that there was a broad support for a mask mandate for our entire county. In total, um, our letter was sent to 183 local elected officials and some folks forwarded it to other elected friends, which is why you may see a park district, fire district or central committee um, elected signature on our letter. Over the course of one weekend, we were honored to see that 34 local elected officials uh, who happened to check their emails this weekend were able to sign. Thank you so much for considering a mask mandate for Monterey County for all of Monterey County. We wanna keep our entire county up and running, including businesses and especially schools. Thank you, Carolyn. Next up we have Marilyn followed by Rick. Can you hear me? We can, thank you for joining us. We have um, a minute 30 on the clock for you. Look, to me, this is a nightmare that is not ending. The Delta variant is one of the common effects of a virus. There will be more variants. So many will cause to stop you to stop you. When will you stop using mandates? When will you realize that the vaccinated are, being are getting COVID and are spreading the virus too, not just the unvaccinated? There are fully vaccinated people ending up in the hospitals, not just unvaccinated. The masks do not fully work. So what is the reason for the mandates? Mandates are not laws. And the Board of Supervisors cannot enforce laws. Your oath of office is to support and defend our rights. Why are you violating them? They are never on hold. The virus will always be around just like any other illness. When will the citizens be allowed to decide on their own health decisions after 18 months? We deserve better by elected officials and elections have consequences. And I'm really getting tired of the control. I yield. Thank you for your comments and thank you for joining us today. Next up we have Rick followed by Kevin. Hi, Chair Askew, uh, supervisors, staff. This is uh, Rick Aldinger. I'm the general manager of the Big Sur River Inn. And uh, I just want to make sure that uh, uh, we all understand that my comments today are in no way in opposition to a mask mandate. I, I certainly understand uh, the motivation for that. <clears throat> uh, my concern, my potential concern is with enforcement and uh, uh, for, for the businesses and, and uh, more particular for this, the staff members of those businesses is where my concern lies. Uh, we, we know uh, during earlier mandates that uh, there is a portion of the, the public and our, our patrons who are going to push back. And it, it puts our frontline staff in a position that I don't want them to be in. 
uh, and that's a, it's a really big deal to me. I hope you understand that. Um, uh, and, and so I guess uh, what I'm hoping uh, is that there is, an, again, just an acknowledgement of that and, and some understanding and empathy, but also that, uh, uh, you know, that there are not going to be sanctions placed against the business if they are unable to effectively uh, enforce those mandates. Uh, I, I in no way want to put any of my staff in a position where uh, they are damaged uh, physically or emotionally. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your comments today, Rick. Next up, we have Kevin followed by Milfa. Kevin Dayton speaking as a private citizen, resident of Monterey County. Actually, I want to praise the Board of Supervisors because you were doing the right decision by, as the legislative branch of our county government, making this decision and making this vote rather than passing it off to Dr. Moreno in the executive branch. And, you know, some local government officials have always passed the tough decisions off to the executive branch so they can, you know, evade the, uh, the praise and criticism. Uh, but last year, I remember you had a, a vote uh, on uh, uh, mandates and restrictions, and you did it rather than passing it off to Dr. Moreno, and you're doing this here today. And I don't, uh, don't envy you because you're, you're going to be getting all sorts of comments, pro and con, and you're going to be the center of, uh, of attention on this. But to tell you the truth, you're supposed to be because you're the legislative branch, you're the elected representatives of the people. So thank you for doing your job and taking this, this uh, vote, which is controversial. And I appreciate how the Board of Supervisors in this county is accessible to the people and is willing to take on responsibilities rather than passing them off. Thank you. Thank you for your comments today, Kevin. Next up, we have Milpa. Uh, yeah, uh, Chair Wendy and Board of Supervisors. My name is Bernie Gomez. And I, today I'm just here uh, speaking as myself, right? Uh, Bernie, uh, as a you know community member, um, you know, it's it's crucial to have the best interests of the public right at hand. And our the best interest is public safety, right? Public health, right? How do we keep how do we keep each other safe? You know, people a big thing, you know, it's like, and this is, and I'll take it, I'm gonna take it here, you know. A lot of I went down down on Main Street in Salinas, and every person of color was masked up. And a lot, a good portion of white people, right? Of white folks, white older men were not, they, they were not uh, uh, masked up. And I went to the Cherry Bean, you know, being safe, you know, cause I know this Delta variant and to these folks, you know, are just like really open, just like really like no care, right? Who's to say that they were asymptomatic, right? Who's to say that they're actually passing, you know? And this is just an example, but it's really, it, I really see that cause my family can't afford to, uh, to be present and provide their comments, right? They can't afford to not wear a mask because they're they're older, they have health problems, and they can, and they can die. And especially, you know, when is it going to be okay to like not wear a mask, right? Until like people stop dying. So until that, until then, it's like, you know, once it close it hits close to home, you know, that's when it gets real for most people. But it hit close to home on my side, so I support this uh, mandate. Thank you for your comments today, Bernie. We're going to go to the phone number ending in 769. And I believe you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself so that we can hear you. This is the phone number ending in 769. It looks like you've been unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Hello. Hi, we've got a minute 30 on the clock for you. Thank you for joining us to share your comments today. Hi, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, I know a lot of the PCR tests were, are proven not to, um, you can't determine viral load, so you can't really tell whether or not someone's actually sick by these tests. And I think the FDA has recalled a lot of these tests. So I'm curious to know where we're getting these numbers from and, and if we can count on them. And then I'm wondering also about if there's some debate out there. We keep hearing maybe from one doctor and then a lot of elected officials, but it doesn't feel like we as the people are getting uh, – normally I, uh, we see doctors working in groups, 
and we get to hear the debate between the doctors, and I feel like we're being kept in the dark and we're not really getting a lot of that debate, so we're not able to decide for ourselves. And I'm, so I'm wondering where these uh, numbers are coming from. I'm wondering if there's comorbidities in these uh, people that are in the hospital and maybe as just our approach to health in general, if 80% of these people uh, have comorbidities or whatever the numbers are, how come we don't talk about those things? And, uh, and also I noticed, too, that there's no discussion of treatments. And these two weeks before people end up in the hospital seem like a really crucial time to be looking for other ideas, other options, other treatments, and having an open mind about treating something besides just this idea of getting a vaccine. Uh, thank, thank you, you. for I your comments it. today. Um, and those are good questions. We do have lots of information on our website. So we're always happy to direct people to the website for additional data, uh, Monterey County specific. Next up, we have Harmony. And Harmony, we've given you permission to unmute. Hello, my name is Harmony. Thank you for having this discussion today. Um, I would like to echo the first speaker regarding common sense, good hygiene. I also like to echo Marilyn Gale, I think she said, Rick Aldinger, as well as supporting the county health director, uh, Dr. Marino's position. Um, strongly support all those positions. I don't know if any of you have worn a mask all day at work, and if you know what that's like as far as a mandate goes. Um, this is a medical intervention on someone's health. When you start looking at the different studies of prolonged use of cloth masks and the increased disease and too much time in an N95, um, those should all be concerning if you're considering a mandate. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and for your comments today. Next up, we have Garrett followed by Kim. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Jerick Bergsma. I'm a local resident and educator. Uh, and I do want to just voice my support for a mask mandate. I think it's a, a fairly simple and fairly effective way to control the spread of the virus. Um, I'm particularly concerned about my young kids who are still too young to get vaccinated. Uh, unfortunately, their health is in the hands of a lot of other people. Uh, and so I'm particularly just concerned that they're going to be impacted by this outside of their, their ability. And I think that anything that we as a society can do to stem the spread and protect them should be done. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for your comments today. Next up, we have Kim followed by Stephanie. Hello, supervisors. Thank you for this important discussion. I'm Kim Stemler. I am speaking for myself, absolutely not representing anyone I work, contract, or volunteer with. I'm a mask wearer. I'm vaccinated. I spend a lot of time helping this community be healthy. This is really important. Requiring everyone to wear a mask may seem as if it can't hurt, but according to an epidemiologist at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in a recent New York Times piece, public leaders shouldn't waste time and credibility enforcing measures if they won't have an impact. Everyone is wary of the pandemic. Throughout the world, we lived under a veil of delusion that this would be over, when in reality, COVID's going to be around for years. It's like influenza. I believe a lot of the current concern is around schools reopening and children being sent home to be quarantined for 10 days after exposure and the craziness that that provides in people's lives, in people's work lives, in businesses. It's, it's a difficult infrastructure issue that needs to be addressed. I ask you, oops, I ask you to, uh, can I have a few extra seconds? I ask you to define your goals and targets before making any decision. What is our goal for vaccination rates, hospitalization rates, transmission rates? We have a 0.0242% case rate for unvaccinated and 0.0007% for vaccinated. That is lower than 1%. How is the virus being transmitted? We stopped collecting data on that. Would a mask mandate make a difference? What research and data are those decisions based on? If you decide to create a mandate, what's the exit strategy? What data points do we need to reach before the mandate will go away? We need to instill confidence. Thank you for your comments, Kim. Um, I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, we're gonna move, we've got a lot of comments ahead of us. We're gonna move on to Stephanie followed by Ricardo. Hi, can you hear me? 
We can. We've got a minute 30 on the clock. Thank you for joining thank us. You. Um, hello, and thank you so much for hosting this discussion this afternoon. My name is Stephanie Snell. I live in South Salinas. Um, I'm speaking for myself, but I am a registered nurse at Natividad, and I have two small kids who attend local schools. Um, I would like to speak in support of the return of a mask ordinance from Monterey County, both indoors and with clear guidance for when masks will be required outdoors. I ask that this board institute a mandate that applies to the entire county. We as the adults in this community need to work harder to get our numbers down, or we're surely going to see higher spread in the schools, leading to school closures, quarantine periods, perhaps hospitalizations or worse for some families. The evidence shows that masks, especially as part of a consistent and multifaceted approach will help reduce spread. We did it before, and as mentioned, many of our neighboring counties have already reinstated masking in public. We need to protect the school kids not yet eligible for vaccination, as well as the broader community. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Next up, we have Ricardo, followed by uh, Karen. Hello, thank you, um, board, for um, having this and and taking upon yourself to um, to have this uh, discussion and and, and have the mandate, um, I believe in the mandate um, because it's not, you know, it has, you know, obviously it has its language and and you know people are scared to, you know, they're going to wear it, you know, eight, you know, however many hours a day. But I just want to remind, you know, uh, all Monterey County and your constituents that freedom isn't free. I mean, we all make sacrifices, but it's done been done in the past um a lot of people have not lived through a pandemic like this in their lives especially not to this magnitude um and um you know just sacrifices always are made every day in 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 america and and if we don't get this under control people are just going to be dying um I just want to say we just we owe our whole livelihoods to to vaccines and and to um, you know having you know the government help and doctors help and um, I just want to just remind everyone that freedom isn't free. Thank you. Thank you for your comments today, Ricardo. Next up, we have Karen followed by Robin. And Karen, we've given you permission to unmute the microphone on your side, but you'll need to take that action to manually unmute. All right, we're still not connecting with Karen, so we'll move on to Robin and circle back again. Try that one more time. I don't. Hi there. My name is Robin Alahi, and I'm a college lecturer. Today I'm speaking as a citizen and I want to express my support for a mask mandate in Monterey County. Recent publicly available data from 20 of California's largest counties support the premise that mask mandates are effective in mitigating increases in COVID cases. I too am tired of wearing a mask, but it's a small sacrifice I'm ready to make because it is much worse to consider the potential alternative of another spike of COVID cases resulting in more extreme measures such as school shutdowns and business shutdowns. Thank you. Thank you for your comments today, Robin. Next up, we're going to try uh, Karen one more time. Karen, are we able to get you unmuted so that we can hear your comments? We'll have you unmute yourself, Karen. Oh, sorry. No, no comment from me. Oh, okay. Very good. All right. We'll move on to um, Dee Land Landley. Uh, hello, thank you very much for taking my um, comment. I guess my it's really two questions. Um, it seems to this point that the, the board has um, observed the health department's direction on COVID policies. I'm just curious, um, what qualifications does the board now have that they did, maybe didn't have before to make these um, health decisions? And uh, moving forward, will the board now assume the role of the county COVID policy authority? Um, and what metrics will they use in this order um, to lift the mandate? Thank you. 
Great, thank you for your comments and thank you all for taking the time to join us today. I see no additional hands raised, so we'll do a final call for our public comment, um, but I will bring it back to our board. Uh, we have a few points that we need to give direction to um, staff on. That would be the age um, that we would want um, a mandate to go into effect. And I believe we heard something about um, ideally matching Santa Cruz. So we're gonna get some feedback about what Santa Cruz is at. There was a desire for um, some direction around enforcement. Um, any uh, information we wanted to provide it, provide about uh, termination. And um, we needed to uh, determine if we were going to host a special meeting um, to have an urgency adoption of an ordinance. Um, there are two more hands up for public comment. This is my last call for public comment. So we'll do um, these uh, two additional um, uh, members of the community and then we'll bring it back to the board for action. So Diana, thank you for joining us. We have a minute 30 on the clock for your comments today. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? We can. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hi. Yes, my name is Diana, and I'm speaking as a private citizen as well. I have three school age children who are unable to be vaccinated at this point. The school is mandating that they wear their masks in classes, but not on the playground. Now, I urge you to allow five year olds to 12 year olds to wear their masks on the playground. I have chosen, as well as my husband, to be vaccinated. We do respect people's options to vaccinate or not vaccinate. However, I don't respect the people who are not vaccinating who are putting my children at risk. I urge you to allow children five to 12 to wear their masks outdoors as well. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you for your comments today, Diana. Um, we'll go to our final public comment, uh, Christine, Christine Byers. Hello, and thank you for all of the work that you do. My name is Christine Byers. I am speaking out as a citizen. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I am the manager of the Family Court Services Department for the Monterey County Superior Court. And I have two children, one who is eligible to be vaccinated and is vaccinated, and one who is not. I also have an immunocompromised spouse living at home, and I am speaking in um, support of a mandatory mask mandate for the entire county. I think that having it be piecemeal in some schools or in some businesses is very confusing to the community and also for visitors to the community. And if it were made simple and clear, I think that there would be a lot better uh, compliance with any mandate that would go into effect and I would truly appreciate having a mask mandate in the work that I do and also in other places where I visit and where my children visit, especially people who are not able to be vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you for your comments today. And again, thank you to everyone who took the time to join us this afternoon and um, manage through our technical difficulties with us. Uh, so I'm gonna bring it back to my colleagues um, for action. Um, we. Uh, do we have any information back about the Santa Cruz um, ordinance and what the age uh, limits are? Yes, Chair. Um, the County of Santa Cruz and most of the other Bay Area counties have adopted the guidance issued by the California Department of Public Health, which indicates anybody uh, two years of age or older should wear a mask indoors. The city of Benicia adopted the 12 years, uh, 12 year old uh, standard. Uh, and I would point out that uh, last year when Dr. Moreno did issue a facial covering order, um, he adopted the 12 year old uh, standard as well. But the consensus seems to be two and above. There is some um, uh, concern, I think, about younger children, say up to the age of 10, who might not take to wearing a mask and might take it off. Uh, and we certainly don't want parents who uh, take reasonable steps to control their children uh, when indoors uh, to be punished for the fact that their child happens to take it off. So we can, we can try to massage some language into the ordinance about that as well. All right, and then in terms of enforcement, were that was there um, an enforcement uh, clause in the Santa Cruz ordinance? Uh, because those were um, it, orders issued by the public health officer, they are by state law misdemeanors uh, to be okay. prosecuted. So in the Benicia ordinance, did uh, that the have the Benicia ordinance? Um, 
I apologize. I don't remember what Benicia had in terms of enforcement, uh, but we could certainly do the administrative um, citation uh, might be the simplest thing to do uh -huh. um, going forward. All right. Um, I guess I'll just come out and say, I think I'm comfortable with um, the administrative citation. Um, I'm comfortable with the, the two and above. And I think um, all of those of us who have children, we do the best we can. And any of the kids four and above are wearing masks at school. So, um, you know, that's a challenge, but it's, we're, we're figuring it out. So I'm comfortable with that, that age range um, with some, you know, language for parents and, you know, individuals to, to manage their children. Um, and I think in terms of termination, um, my interest would be, um, ensuring that, that until such time that our children have the option to get vaccinated with, um, with a vaccine, uh, that would be, I think my, um, uh, my, my intent, um, and, or if the CDC, uh, tier rating system is something that's been uh, consistently used in other places, I'm comfortable with that, but I'll pass it over to my colleagues for any, um, additional, uh, feedback on those specific points. Supervisor Alejo. Uh, I think the question for County Council is, does he need a motion to move forward on this and then to be able to set a special meeting? And, and if so, um, looking at the calendars, what, what would he recommend? Can we, uh, call for a special meeting on Thursday or is Tuesday uh, more feasible due to the Labor Day weekend? Chair, uh, responding, I would appreciate a motion with the specific direction to go into the ordinance and a direction to come back. As for the date, I think that's clearly up to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we would have to publish an agenda 24 hours in advance. That might prove to be a little bit of a challenge. I know um, there's an urgency to this, but um, maybe noticing the special meeting for next Tuesday is the best option. And county it, council, that's, that's up to the board and county council what we didn't also answer that i think needs to be addressed is if we were to act on an ordinance whatever meeting day it's on how many days after would you recommend it going into effect to give notice to businesses to be able to prepare to institute the mask order um, again, that's a policy question. An urgency ordinance is generally effective immediately, but the ordinance could make the uh, requirement for facial coverings effective at some time afterwards. So maybe no more than a week, I would think. This is certainly going to get some publicity as it is. And so I would think that businesses might already start being on notice. So if you were to have a special meeting on Tuesday, maybe make the effective date of the the following weekend to give uh, businesses and individuals time to prepare. Great. Thank you. And, and with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to move that we move forward on um, indoor mask order that include the administrative enforcement procedures as recommended by County Council, that the age that it applied to the same ages as, <sighs> as the other Bay Area counties so that it, it is consistent with what our neighboring counties north of us have already done. Um, and ha we haven't seen issues or, or reports that there's been problems with that age um, range within the ordinance. Uh, so I think w that makes us more comfortable as they've, they've already had this in, in effect for, for a period longer than us. And, um, and that I, I would say that a meeting be called on for either Thursday or Tuesday, whatever works good with our chair and our, our county council uh, about when they could agendize that for the appropriate special meeting. And oh, yeah, Greg, I'll second that. Um, well, I was going to ask Madam problem. Chair just to make sure all board members are available or at least, or at least enough to uh, uh, pass a motion. With a motion in a second. Um, I do want to hear from Supervisor Lopez, who we haven't had a chance to hear from yet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple concerns. I mean, for me, we are breaking with our our health officer that that is concerning to me considering the line that we followed from the beginning of this pandemic i'm not saying that i oppose this i'm just saying that it is a point of concern for me that we're we've moved to the political realm on that end on the other it's the you know the, really the 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 questions that have been elevated here about the time frame on the ending that i haven't heard some sort of suggestion for us i would like to hear from my colleagues on that and then the third is throughout this pandemic we've said that the policies that our board could pass would not impact the cities obviously we've we've learned there's other potential uh, legal frameworks that could allow for that but 
given that change, I would ask that whatever we do here, we send a letter uh, expressing that we would love to have opinions from our cities uh, in a more official format rather than just taking sort of what we do and don't hear. I would like to give them that opportunity to voice opinions, seeing as through the, this entire pandemic, we have said that we were uh, we were not, uh, we were not, we did not have that authority to make that decision within the cities. So I'd love to hear from them and at least get their input in a more official way. Again, I'm not opposed to the ordinance. I, you know, I, I do think that it's, uh, it's something that's prudent given everything that I've seen. I've, I've been out of town recently and it's how most people are behaving and it is the right way to go. Uh, but again, just some questions in terms of how we're breaking from our norm and from the last 18 months that I, I want to make sure are on the table and at least discussed before the special. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lopez. Did you have suggestions about an end date? I did propose um, either at some point once children have opportunity to be vaccinated so that everyone has had that opportunity um, for, for vaccine protection or um, aligning with a CDC tier system, which is what it sounds like uh, Benicia had done. If you have other opinions or thoughts, I think now would be a great time to hear them. I think uh, for me, it's more of a time frame. You know, if you know more like 60 days and then we revisit every 60 days only because if case rates fall to a point that it's no longer a major concern in our community, then we can not decide not to reenact it at that point. There are different triggers, obviously, that should also be considered. But for me, the concern is we don't know what that potential time frame is for uh, the vaccination authorization for children. Would a 90 day time frame work for you? 90 is a bit long for me, that's, you know, but again, look, look to the rest of the board as well. All right, and what was your suggestion, Supervisor Alejo? Uh, I didn't address it in my motion, but I, I would be comfortable with a 60 day. Obviously, after 60 days, the board could extend it. If things improve dramatically within the next two months, the board could always decide to agendize it and end it sooner. So I think we're always empowered to, to do that either way. But if, if we're trying to give a, a message that, this is being done because of what we are observing, but there's a, a, a shorter time frame to make uh, our residents more comfortable with it. I think that's that's a, a workable that's a workable proposal to include into our action that we will take up at the special meeting. All right, and Supervisor Phillips. Well, I, I county council had a comment. Uh, less, and then Supervisor. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, in, in light of uh, Supervisor Lopez and Supervisor Alejo's suggestion that uh, the, the condition might read the earlier of termination by this board or 60 days from the uh, effective date of the mask requirement. With the option to renew? Yes, unless unless extended. Unless extended. Right. right. Okay. Does that work for you, Supervisor Alejo, as a motion maker? We're muted. You're muted, my friend. Oh, I would include that in, into the motion, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Phillips. And, and uh, I, I, I think that's right, and I would support the sixty-day um, uh, re with the, the option to renew. All right. Do we have any other outstanding questions yes. for the motion, uh, Supervisor Adams? Sorry. Are we going to get into the nitty-gritty of the motion, like the the parts about you know exceptions, essentially? You know, yes, you're indoors, but as we say here, if you're in a room working by yourself, will the ordinance cover all of those kinds of uh, caveats? Les, could you restate what the exceptions were? Um, uh, and you're referencing the Santa Cruz ordinance yes, as a model? And, and uh, what we were looking to model was the health officer orders from the Bay Area, including Santa Cruz. So it is um, in your own residence or working in a closed room or office alone or with members of your household. When you are actively performing an activity that cannot be done while wearing a face covering, i.e., actively eating or drinking, swimming or showering in a fitness facility or obtaining a medical or cosmetic service requiring removal of a face covering, or as specifically exempted from the use of face coverings under guidance from the California Department of Public Health. For example, if you need to communicate with somebody who is hearing impaired and needs to read lips basically, or where uh, a face covering poses a safety risk. So those are the standard ones, and it does refer to guidance from the California Department of Public Health. 
so those are the standard ones. Are those the ones that we're going to um, abide by? Well, those are the ones that we would have in the draft ordinance. You could always, when we have the special meeting, you could always Pretty dictate good. that something be added or something be removed. Okay. All right, good. Thank you very much for that. All right. And in terms of a date, I think Thursday or Tuesday would be great. Uh, Tuesday allows us a little extra extra time to do outreach to our um, our district cities uh, to make sure that they've had a chance to to read the document and provide any feedback. Um, Madam Chair, I will not be able to make either of those meetings. Thursday or Tuesday. No, I could make it Wednesday at 9 a.m. Tomorrow at 9 a.m.? A week from tomorrow. A week from tomorrow at 9 a.m. Um, any other preferences in terms of a, a Tuesday or a, or do we want to wait till Wednesday at 9 a.m.? Chair, I would just point out that an urgency ordinance needs four votes. Oh, okay. Well, we might need Mary there then. Um, so Wednesday at 9 a.m.? Shall we clarify the date? Next Wednesday at 9 a.m.? Wednesday, um, September 8th at 9 a.m. Yeah, just did. Supervisor Phillips, you may have a conflicting meeting, just to let you know. <laughs> I see the power row meeting at 9 a.m. on that day. Unless other colleagues would like to um, see a special meeting sooner, um, knowing that we would need four votes and we may not have Mary present. All right, no one's weighing in. So does Wednesday, September 8th at 9 a.m. work? Well, yeah, that he's right, and he's got my calendar better than I do. But uh, <laughs> which I, I feel like I'm home. Um, but uh, th that's one that I think I have to be at. Um, what about one between one and three on that same day? That works for me. Well, one o'clock. So we're looking at Wednesday, September eighth, at one p.m. Yes. To get a thumbs up from Lopez, a thumbs up. I, from... I cannot be there. Mm. Two o'clock. Can we just say that it'll be scheduled as soon as yep. possible and yep. let staff work through that? Okay. All right. Yep. I think that 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 works. We're going to have to make it happen. Okay. Um, so with that, we have a motion. We have a second, um, and we'll take a roll call vote. Supervisor Lejo. Aye. Supervisor Phillips. Aye. Supervisor Lopez. Yes. Supervisor Adams? Aye. And Chair Supervisor Root ask you. Aye. Perhaps right. 8 a.m. on September 8th? Well, we will have to circle back. I think we want to keep moving through our agenda here. Um, next up, we have item number 14. And actually, I think um, we might, we've got a lot of people who've been waiting here um, all day for item number 15, um, which has had a request for continuation. So if it's all right with everyone, if we move item number 15 first, uh, since I think we can handle that fairly quickly, I'm, if I'm jumping to conclusions. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to, to, to 14, but we'll start 15 now. And this is um, a Riverview at Las Palmas Assisted Living Senior Facility continued from July 20th, 2021. Thank you, Chair Askew, and good afternoon, Supervisors. Craig Spencer with Housing and Community Development. Uh, we do have a request to continue this matter to October 12th uh, from the applicant's representative who could not be here today. So I suggest the board take up that matter before, and uh, staff would be prepared to present uh, if the board desires to continue. And, and sorry, Mr. Spencer, is there any opposition, do you know, on that continuance? I have heard no opposition to the continuance request specifically. Could we ask to hear from, I see um, the appellant here in the audience. Is there any opposition to continuing to October 12th? Good evening, members of the chair. Christine Kemp on behalf of the Homeowners Association. Uh, we came in today understanding that it was most likely going to be continued at the request of the applicant, so we recognize that. We do just want to thank uh, Supervisors Adams and Phillips for their comments on the 20th and really just don't want to lose that momentum. We had a resolution of intent to deny and um, just want to keep moving forward and not lose the momentum that we had with any continuance. So um, with that, uh, you know, we'll accept the fact that it is being continued, but hopefully keep moving forward here. Thank you. All right, thank you. So this would require a motion from um, the board to continue um, until dates are in October 12th. So moved. Second. 
All right, we have a motion from Adams, a second from Phillips. Is there any public comment specific to the continuance, not specific to um, the item? Supervisor Lopez? No, my hand was no. up to make the motion, but I got oh. run over right. We're good. <laughs> we got run over over here. Um, all right, so uh, seeing no public comment, we'll bring it back to the board for a vote. Um, we have a motion to continue um, this item until October 12th. We'll take a roll call. Supervisor Leho. Aye. Supervisor Phillips. Aye. Supervisor Lopez. Aye. Supervisor Adams. Aye. And Chair Supervisor Root ask you. Aye. All right. Thank you. And apologies for having you wait, wait all, all afternoon, but thank you. Uh, we'll see you back here on October 12th. All right, we will circle back to item number 14, which is to receive a report on the findings of the equity assessment um, for the Monterey County Cannabis Program. And I believe we have uh, Joanne here with us today. We have actually, um, we have uh, Miles, uh, Miles, <laughs> Etchnik, Etchnik, uh, who's our cannabis analyst, uh, Dr. Ignacio Navarro and Dr. Kim, both from CSUMB. So thank you for joining us, and we'll pass the microphone over to you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Miles Etchnik, uh, cannabis analyst for the Monterey County Cannabis Program. Uh, here with me today is Joanne Iwamoto, our cannabis program manager, and staff from the Institute for Community Collaborative Studies at California State University, Monterey Bay. Uh, which are Ignacio Navarro and Jessica Liat. Uh, we are here to present findings from the equity assessment, which is a grant funded initiative to inform the development of a local equity program. Uh, the goal of an equity program is to provide inclusion through the reduction of barriers to entry into the multi-billion dollar licensed cannabis industry to those who were previously criminalized by the war on drugs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so work towards the equity assessment began early in 2020 uh, with the application for type one funding made to the governor's office of business and economic development in March of 2020. Uh, in April of 2020, uh, the program was informed of the award amount of $150,000. And in May of 2020, the board of supervisors authorized the cannabis program manager to execute that grant agreement. Uh, in August, the full agreement was executed with uh, the University Corporation at Monterey Bay uh, to begin work on the equity assessment. I'd like to take this time now to hand over the presentation to Ignacio Navarro, who is our principal, invest principal investigator from the ICCS, who will walk you through the research goals, the methodology, the findings, and the conclusion of the equity, conclusions of the equity assessment. Ignacio? Thank you, uh, Miles, Joanne, um, and thank you, uh, supervisors, for having us here and to briefly present the main findings from um, our equity assessment uh, project. Um, as Miles mentioned, we started uh, last year. Uh, next, next slide, please. And uh, per the grant, uh, we had three goals. Uh, the first one was to quantify the impact of cannabis criminalization in Monterey County. Uh, in the past, uh, especially identifying uh, disproportionate impacts on different demographic groups throughout the county. Uh, we also had the mandate to identify some of the barriers to enter the legal cannabis industry in Monterey County uh, and identify potential eligibility characteristics uh, for uh, applicants to, uh, to a future uh, equity program that could be uh, established in the county. Um, we also uh, conducted a thorough research of what other jurisdictions have, um, have done with uh, their equity uh, funds uh, from the state. And we juxtapose all these findings to provide some recommendations uh, for the Monterey County uh, Cannabis Program and for you to consider. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to conduct this assessment, we conducted a, a literature review, uh, looking at laws and looking at other uh, assessment uh, and other um, equity programs in the county. We also conducted a historical analysis of jail bookings uh, in uh, collaboration with the sheriff's office. We conducted meetings with industry groups and industry stakeholders. Uh, for, we conducted a series of meetings. And from these meetings, we, uh, 
developed uh, two survey instruments. Uh, one that was asked, uh, uh, done to uh, get information from uh, existing businesses and existing uh, licensed applicants uh, and to collect their views and opinions about an, a future equity program. And another one uh, to collect the views and opinions from the community uh, at large. Next slide, please. So um, in the main, uh, so the main findings uh, that I'm gonna be talking uh, briefly about uh, to, uh, today, uh, we uh, separated them by, by goal. So the first one was to uh, look at uh, the impact of cannabis criminalization in Monterey County. Next slide, please. And we looked at arrest data, which is the only uh, data that was available for us. Um, it was provided by the Sheriff's Office. And we uh, found out that between 1995 and December 2006, when uh, cannabis was uh, sort of legalized in the state, about 7,050 individuals experienced 9,400 arrests that involved uh, 11,000 cannabis charges uh, in the county. Uh, most, 80%, about 80% of individuals that experience bookings with, um, with a cannabis related charge only experienced one booking. And most of these uh, of these bookings had only one cannabis related charge. Um, looking at the types of charges that individuals were arrested uh, for, um, we found that the majority, about 70%, uh, their most severe uh, cannabis related charge was just possession and like which today uh, that would be legal. Um, for 14%, their most severe was uh, possession with intent to sell. And for 12%, it was sale without a license. And for 4%, it was cultivation. Next slide, please. We found some uh, disparities uh, by race and ethnicity. The detail is in, in the report. Um, but in general, we found that um, African-American and, and, and Hispanic uh, individuals had a, 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 a larger share of arrests uh, that, uh, than white or other racial groups um, when compared to their share of the population. And, and this is uh, even accounting for the, for the changes in, 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 in the demographic profile over the last 30 years. We also found uh, oh, part of this disparity was explained by African-American and Hispanic individuals uh, having a higher likelihood of, of experience more than one arrest with a, uh, uh, with a cannabis related charge. Um, we also found a couple of uh, uh, slight disparities by geographic area with uh, the city of Salinas and the unincorporated area of the county having a higher share of arrests than their share of the population um, in the county. Next slide, please. So to understand how these arrests uh, may have impacted the population, we asked uh, individuals in our consult in our uh, meetings and in the survey, how how having arrests uh, or, or cannabis related arrests impacted them, and um, the majority responded, well, it it it, it beyond the loss of property if, or financial employment opportunities resulting from having a criminal record, uh, they you know they also faced the stigma of these arrests with uh, with, with with employers which some of them still face uh, to this day. And this also uh, contributed to uh, uh, deep-seated feelings of distrust in government um, and the public uh, and the public sector or government and, and, and I'm sorry, uh, law enforcement. Um, and a lot of these feelings were, you know, were, were, were uh, still very strong. And, and we found this out in our surveys and, our, uh, and the conversations we had with uh, stakeholders. Next slide, please. In our surveys and the uh, uh, conversations, we asked them uh, about the barriers they, they, they faced um, entering the, uh, the, the legal cannabis uh, business in the county. And next slide, please. And it, there were many uh, barriers identified. Uh, in general, we grouped them into uh, costs associated to startups, uh, to starting up the business. Um, and these costs of renting or purchasing equipment or making changes to property to meet the county permitting uh, and state permitting requirements. 
Uh, these are investments that have to be made up front without even having a permit. Like before they apply for the permit, they have to incur these costs. And they represented a, 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 um, an, an, an important uh, barrier for entry. We, we, this was almost uh, unanimous across our conversations. And um, another, another big barrier was understanding and meeting the permitting requirements at the state, county levels, and for some businesses, even city. Um, they, some of these regulations are uh, conflicting or overlapping, and uh, it's hard to navigate through all of them, especially for small um, or for entrepreneurs that want to set up small operations. Next slide, please. So, um, but these barriers were not experienced uh, equally by all. Um, some businesses experience uh, barriers to a different degree than others. For example, small like outdoor growers, their main barrier was had to do with zoning regulations or fire or water regulations. Uh, and for the indoor big growers, it was more uh, the uh, infrastructure and, 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 and um, the construction sort of uh, barriers that they face or requirements that they face. Now, um, what we heard across the board was that, you know, if there's going to be an equity program that will help, you know, businesses get into the, uh, in, into the market, there, there should be a deep analysis of these barriers. Um, some of these barriers uh, cut across different offices in the county and even the state and the cities. And so uh, what we, you will hear from Jessica in, in, in our recommendations is that uh, as part of the, equity, as, uh, of the equity program, there should be some analyses, uh, policy analysis of, of, of these specific barriers, right? Why do we have them? And maybe go through a cost benefit analysis of these barriers on whether it's it's beneficial to uh, um, reconsider them, uh, drop them, or keep them, um, because you know it would be it would defeat the purpose of an equity program to provide assistance if the barriers are insurmountable for those that receive the assistance. Next slide, please. So um, we also asked them to uh, share with us what they thought uh, an equity program would uh, or, or should look like. And uh, next slide, please. And when asked about who should be receiving this uh, or, or help, um, almost across the board, and this is the community and the business side, they said individuals and neighborhoods uh, that were disproportionately impacted by past criminalization should get priority to be participants of this uh, type of uh, equity program. And also individuals that have an arrest uh, uh, for, for, for uh, cannabis related charges. Um, and uh, they felt very strongly that the help should go to local individuals who have been in the local industry for a while um, and who have deep ties with the community and the, uh, and the business, uh, uh, or I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, with the cannabis business. Uh, also, they expressed that the size and like smaller businesses should get uh, more help. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what the, uh, the equity program um, should uh, do, uh, in their in their opinion, um, was that it should address these regulatory barriers. Um, you know, probably. I mean, it, it, some of the suggestions were, you know, probably look at. Uh, uh, you know, tiered system of, of taxes or, or, or costs for permits, um, provide assistance with the application processes um, and regulatory compliance, provide assistance with navigating this uh, maze of state, city, and um, county regulations, and also maybe uh, provide assistance with business development in the form of, uh, could be uh, incubators or just setting up, um, the, uh, th th these operations. Next slide, please. Um, so those were some of the findings uh, that we got from uh, our, our data analysis and from asking the stakeholders. Uh, what you'll hear now is uh, what we found from looking at other uh, equity programs. And finally, our recommendation based on um, the overall findings. 
Thank you, and I will welcome questions after uh, my colleague is uh, done presenting. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Liet, and I am an analyst for the Institute for Community Collaborative Studies. And I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the conclusions and considerations for a future equity program in Monterey County. So in this section, I will be discussing the conclusions of our assessment, as well as items to consider for a future equity program in Monterey County, including programmatic considerations, as well as potential eligibility criteria for individuals and for businesses. These conclusions and recommendations are based upon the feedback from focus groups, um, as my colleague was discussing, um, as well as surveys of industry participants and community members, in addition to an analysis of um, other jurisdictions equity programs across California. Next slide, please. So um, as Ignacio was starting to discuss, um, before we get into the details of our programmatic recommendations, we wanted to discuss a few steps that we believe would be important to consider prior to the design and implementation of an equity program in Monterey County. As outlined by my colleague in conducting the study, it became apparent that there are a variety of barriers to participation in the industry that are currently affecting stakeholders and that would likely impact equity applicants as well. Before implementation of an equity program, we are recommending an analysis of current policies, which pose a barrier to those hoping to enter the industry to identify whether these policies are working as intended. Um, to also identify their impact on stakeholders and whether any changes or updates are needed to minimize barriers to those currently involved or wanting to become involved in the cannabis industry in Monterey County. We are also recommending an analysis of current administrative processes pertaining to the industry, such as the permitting process, to identify whether agency procedures can be improved or streamlined in an effort to serve constituents more effectively or efficiently. Addressing these concerns before implementing an equity program has the potential to reduce equity program costs. So for example, reducing processing time for applications or removing the requirement to obtain a property before applying for a permit could reduce uh, the need to pro provide um, financial supports to help people get through that period where they're waiting for their permits to be approved. Our programmatic recommendations in the following slides are based on current policies and practices as we understand them. So in this slide, um, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about the programmatic considerations that we're recommending the county think about um, as they're, they're uh, designing an equity program for um, our local area. And we've organized the programmatic considerations according to um, the way that funding has uh, been organized when it's distributed by the state. So there's 10% uh, will be available for administrative assistance the majority of funding will be available for, for financial assistance, which is 80% um, of the, the grant funds. And then 10% will be available for technical assistance. So we've kind of um, organized our recommendations that way as well. So given the feedback from surveys and focus groups, in addition to our review of other jurisdictions, we are recommending that the county consider the following programmatic characteristics when developing a future equity program. Uh, first, administrative assistance to equity applicants, including expedited application review and processing, um, which, as my colleague mentioned, was one of the main barriers for people trying to enter the industry, uh, the amount of time that it takes to, to obtain a permit, um, as well as attention to regulatory barriers as identified by stakeholders. As for financial supports, we're also recommending assistance, including um, support with rent, lease, or purchase of a property. Uh, any uh, upgrades or compliance related property changes that are necessary, costs related to cannabis, uh, state cannabis licenses and Monterey County permits and assistance with local taxes, which was mentioned by our stakeholder or yeah, in our stakeholder meetings and our surveys is something that is still a concern for especially for small businesses. Um, we're also recommending financial support to uh, incentivize partnerships. Um, such as an incubator program, which would encourage cost and resource sharing among uh, you know, those who are already experienced in the industry and those who are trying to, <clears throat> to get their bearings in the industry. Additionally, the county should also consider offering technical assistance as part of an equity program, which could include um, business consultation partnerships and mentorships, uh, which may look like some kind of uh, mentorship or training programs, uh, again, that are provided in consultation with um, businesses that have already gotten off the ground and are doing well in the county. Um, 
our stakeholders also mentioned that um, they could use guidance and support with regard to the application process and also with uh, coming into and maintaining compliance for their uh, business. And we're also recommending uh, the consideration of employment training services for um, individuals who might want to come into the industry, not necessarily to open a business, but to become, um, you know, uh, an entry level employee or a manager um, to get some kind of professional training so that they're able to enter the industry. So now that I've uh, just, oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> now that we've gone over some of the programmatic uh, characteristics that we recommend um, be considered, I'm also gonna discuss some of the eligibility characteristics um, when determining who should have access to the benefits of a future equity program. So based on the input of local stakeholders and focus groups um, and our survey responses, we're recommending that the following items be considered as the county works to develop an equity program. So the first is um, that uh, applicants should have a history of cannabis related arrests and or convictions. Um, so this will help support those who were negatively impacted by cannabis criminalization. Um, as Ignacio mentioned, residency and investment in the local community was also something that was mentioned uh, many times by stakeholders as something that's important to them to make sure that funding goes to local candidates who are invested in our local community. We're also recommending that uh, diversity be considered to support people of color who have disproportionately been harmed by crim cannabis criminalization, but also to encourage less traditional applicants um, to join this industry, including women and LGBTQ uh, plus individuals. Uh, low income status is another characteristic um, that we thought might be important to consider as a means of economic development and also to support those whose incomes may have been impacted uh, by a criminal record and to address uh, issues surrounding generational poverty that could, um, can and has resulted for some uh, from the effects of cannabis criminalization. And lastly, housing status. Um, again, this could also be a means of economic development, but um, this is, we also wanted this to be considered to address the effects of a criminal record on housing, uh, including housing discrimination, homelessness, eviction, foreclosure, or revocation of housing subsidy, which um, occurred for many people with cannabis, uh, a history of cannabis arrests or conviction on their record, and this predominantly affected people of color. Next slide, please. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna talk about the eligibility criteria that we uh, you know, are putting forth for consideration um, for business applicants. So in some jurisdictions, they have criteria if an individual wants to apply and also criteria if an, a whole business would like to apply for benefits um, through an equity program. Um, so based on the input of local stakeholders and our review of other jurisdictions, um, these are the items that we thought would be important to consider in Monterey County. So the first is uh, the size of the business. As Ignacio mentioned, um, we received several comments about, and, and in our survey received responses about the importance of um, supporting small businesses um, that are trying, especially those that are still trying to enter, enter the industry and compete with larger businesses who have more resources. Uh, we also found that an ownership requirement might be beneficial um, to ensure that equity applicants maintain a majority stake in their business and therefore control of business decisions, and also in an effort to protect applicants from predatory practices by those who um, have in some cases in other jurisdictions exploited uh, equity applicants um, and, and been able to benefit from that without the applicants actually getting their, their piece of the, the bargain or you know, they didn't get their benefit. Um, we're also recommending the consideration of a workforce requirement. Uh, again, this could be a means of economic development where, um, Businesses are provided benefits and, and if they are uh, hiring a certain percentage of people from the equity program or equity applicants. So this would encourage the hiring of equity applicants among existing businesses. Uh, we're also um, suggesting that uh, an incubator requirement be considered to encourage established businesses to share workspace equipment and or expertise with equ equity applicants. And lastly, um, geographic location is something that was used by other jurisdictions to target the areas that are um, most in need of support. And that varied. Some jurisdictions uh, you know, focused on low income areas, some focused on areas that were targeted during the war on drugs. So there are different ways of, of looking at that. 
Next slide, please. Uh, so a few other items that uh, should be considered when planning for and implementing an equity program in Monterey County. Uh, we're recommending a focus on community engagement as the county moves forward with equity program development. Uh, distrust of government, police, and the criminal justice system were emphasized in our survey responses as severe impacts of cannabis criminalization. Because of these concerns, it may be necessary to actively encourage those most in need of equity supports to apply. The design of an effective equity program will require collaboration between county officials, law enforcement, the district attorney's office, and industry stakeholders, as well as community members. It is also important to keep in mind that the legal cannabis industry, as well as equity programs, are still in their infancy. Jurisdictions are trying their best to support those harmed by cannabis criminalization, but we're still in an experimental phase. Um, most jurisdictions are still in the process of learning about um, how their policies are affecting those that they're intending to, to assist. Um, so these programs are dynamic. They're amending them um, when needed and adapting as needed. And um, I think it will be important for Monterey County to also stay apprised of other jurisdictions ongoing efforts to uh, learn from best practices and continue seeking and incorporating feedback on the unique needs of our local community. With that, I will turn it over to Miles and Joanne. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Uh, Joanne Umoto, Cannabis Program. So the program has learned that um, for an effective equity program, it will require collaboration between the Board of Supervisors, the cannabis program, the community, and the licensed industry. It's really important to note that no jurisdiction has a perfect equity program model, although we have interviewed uh, the city of Oakland, and we are using them as one of our benchmarks. The license industry is still in its infancy, infancy, infancy within the state of California, um, and we're still developing our policies. Next slide, please. Recommendation C requests that direction is given to the cannabis program manager to develop an equity program structure. And the slide <clears throat> that is before you outlines the five steps that we propose. It's a phased approach that we take uh, small steps at a time. We conduct a focus group to further engage um, the communities for eligibility criteria. We revisit the retirement reme remediation and relocation, which is ref often referred to as the triple R concept as a potential benefit. We organize workshops with the cannabis cultivators to gain input for an incubator component. And fifth, we identify county funding, a county funding source and commitment um, for an amount for the equity program. Staff is also requesting that this board approve that the cannabis program manager apply for the state of California tier two equity grant, which we believe the application will be available in December. Next slide. So at this time, I'd like to thank Cal State Monterey Bay for all their work um, on this equity assessment. And this does conclude our presentation and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for the presentation and all of the work and the report. Um, I will ask my colleagues if there's any questions for our presenter, Supervisor Adams. Yes, first I want to um, applaud your wisdom in choosing ICCS to work on your project. Um, I had the opportunity of working with them in depth um, at United Way when we did the big impact survey and it was so such a wonderful experience. So I uh, am very happy to see Ignacio again and, and know that the work uh, is excellent. Um, secondly, I just wanted to ask as far as looking at the five steps that you had on the final slide, what sort of time frame would you be looking at? And I'm particularly interested because many people have asked me for information about the Triple R program, especially when I look at areas um, in uh, some in Big Sur, but primarily out in the Kashawa area, that um, the situation on the property has changed, including some devastated by fire. So I was just wondering how, um, what the time frame would be to see if we could even start to look at the at the Triple A program, Triple R program, which would give us Triple A, you know, success. <laughs> So based on the um, input that we've received from Nicole Elliott, the Department of Cannabis Control um, Executive Director, it would benefit the county if we proceeded quickly with, um, with a, an equity program here in our county. And so we will shift uh, workloads and we will start, we've already started working on it, but we will um, 
we will work to hopefully bring it back to the full board, maybe within the next six, six to eight weeks. Um, it would include that. We may not be able to have completed all five of those items, but it's, it's really bringing back the structure of the program so that we can continue the work. Anything here? No. All right. I do have a couple of questions. Um, so I guess I, there's, um, there's sort of a, a, a dual, uh, the, the, the assessment, the equity assessment had a dual sort of focus, right? So there's a focus on um, the ways in which, uh, um, I need a reference back to my report here, the ways in which um, cannabis uh, criminalized um, uh, margin, already marginalized communities and sort of what we do with that and how we begin to right those wrongs, essentially. And, um, you know, it's uh, only African-American individuals continue to experience a disproportionate share of arrests between 2006 and 2016. Let's look over the past 10 years, one very specific um, population within the county. So when we talk about the stakeholder um, and focus groups, it looks like we were really instead focusing on those who are already operating within the cannabis industry. Can you speak at all to focus groups um, and feedback that came specific to the impact of cannabis criminalization and how that might relate to um, a, a equity program that, that, that serves to, um, to mitigate those, those harms of the past? Um. Absolutely. Um, that is a, an, an excellent point. Um, the grant required us to quantify, um, you know, the, the disproportionate impact of criminalization, and that's uh, that's what we found. Um, and we, however, yeah, and, and you are right in pointing out that the industry is not. Uh, you know, there is uh, is not represented by minority groups. <laughs> there, there, there's there's a small representation uh, of 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 African American and Latino uh, in 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 the industry, and this is statewide and nationwide. Um, and so, when we wanted to learn about the barriers, and we asked, uh, you know, in the focus groups and the surveys, uh, the barriers experienced. Um, yeah, we, we, we only focused on those who are already in the business or want to be in the business, those who, who, who applied or, or, uh, or have already received a license. So, um, it, yeah, a lot of the, uh, um, of the comments and responses on the impact of criminalization are from those who are already wanting or are in the industry and, we did not. Um, we could not capture the the those impacts from minority populations because they're they're, they're underrepresented in the industry. So, with either this assessment where we move forward, or the the the, the grant that's mentioned, the um, additional state of California local assistance grant program. I mean, it seems it seems to me that if we're talking about an equity program for cannabis that it's incumbent upon us to reach out and hear from those in our community who who have been negatively affected by cannabis criminalization and so stakeholder groups like milpa the village project the NAACP, um, whether those are individuals who are currently applying for uh, licensure for the cannabis industry um, I just, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm missing the connection. It seems like we, we checked the box by saying, yes, we, we quantified it, but then we continued down a path without acknowledging or doing anything with that information. So, so what, what, so given where we're at today, what opportunities are there moving forward to make sure that we're, we're tying those two pieces together and, and acknowledging that there really is, you know, no, um, there's no way that we're going to be able to rectify the, the past um, criminalization you know, through this or any other equity program, but uh, you know, like I feel like there's got to be more that can be done than what's presented in this assessment. Uh, 
uh, Madam Chair, the, the way that the grant funding has come forward to the, the local jurisdictions from the state of California, uh, the way that's structured and the way the eligible uses of funding are really such that it fosters um, an expansion of the industry itself and not necessarily affording benefits to those who are not interested in participating in, in the industry, if that makes sense. So the funding itself and the way it can be applied is limited to streamlining um, those barriers or entry for those who do want to participate. If we, if Monterey County wanted to take a stance where we applied uh, county funding, perhaps out of the cannabis assignments to pursue other programs to afford benefits to those who are not interested in participating in industry, but still have been harmed. That is something we can explore. Okay. And so I guess I, I, maybe I wasn't super clear, but I think how can we, how can we know who's interested in, in participating if we haven't reached out to the groups that have been most harmed? And so I guess I don't need an answer. Maybe we don't have an answer. Um, but as we move forward, I would hope that we can make a very intentional effort, not just to, um, when we're talking about equity programs, not just to engage with those who are already engaged, but to really step outside of the traditional box and um, inquire with groups that represent um, those who've been disadvantaged by um, and criminalized um, and whose lives have been ruined and families' lives have been ruined um, by criminalization of cannabis to reach out to them, to inquire, you know, it, is this something that you ever wanted to get involved in? What would this look like? How, what would a workforce um, uh, incubator uh, look like to you? Is this something that you would want to have opportunity to, um, you know, gain uh, for uh, an understanding of a career path? How can we engage with you as a part of the streamlining of processes and interest, um, uh, bringing people into the into the industry in a, in um, alliance? Um, as the grant requires, uh, but doing so in a way that really does make a direct connection back to the assessment findings from goal one. So that would be, I guess, just thank you for clarifying those questions. Um, let's bring it uh, to any of my other colleagues, uh, Supervisor Alejo, and then after that, we'll go to public comment. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I think there, there's a way to address that by just to holding some additional workshops on to engage other groups that have, haven't been able to weigh in so far, such as some of the ones that you mentioned. I think, I think that's a, a valid point. Um, it doesn't take too much, a couple hours in, on, on a day or, or two um, to get just some additional input as we're trying to craft what an equity program would look like in Monterey County. And as Staff Riley pointed out, there's no perfect or ideal program that are out there. Some counties are ahead of us uh, because they, they began that work. We, we delayed it because we, we had so much volatility within our cannabis industry in Monterey County. And then we had to deal with hemp and then the small outdoor program. There was a lot of um, policy priorities and not enough staff to get around to doing it all at the same time. So we got to a point where there's added incentives from the state and kind of a push from the state also for, for cannabis cultivating counties to implement equity programs, but it could look um, a lot of different ways. But I, I, wanna, I want us to also be real about equity prog prog program and, and with, with everything, there's cost. And we, we get asked for, for many different things from a lot of different county residents and stakeholders. And we could throw a lot of money at a thing, but doesn't mean it's gonna be successful just because we're throwing money at it. I think we need to be real and strategic and, and understanding that trying to get into the cannabis industry, it's like telling any person without experience go into hospitality, go into restaurant business, go into agriculture. If somebody asked me to go into lettuce growing, um, I, I don't think I would be very successful because I, ha I've had, I haven't had any training or experience in doing that. That's how sophisticated cannabis is. It's a very competitive industry. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of re uh, reporting, very heavily regulated with the state and federal laws. And so I, I think when, when uh, as a member of the cannabis committee, when Joanne came and just started getting input on early input on what a cannabis program is, I, I kind of th thought, let's start with the basics. Certainly with expediting permits or um, um, alleviating, alleviating some of the permitting costs, that seems reasonable. But even if you did all that, just like any other business in California, there's a high likelihood of not being successful. So if I wanted to go to a restaurant a business today or any other kind of small business, th there's a high probability that the odds are against me to continue to be successful. So what do we need to do to have 
impacted communities be able to learn the industry and be successful, be able to make investments that don't, are not lost in a year or two because, um, you know, the competitive market. And I think that's where we need, really need to look at small cultivation programs, uh, small business incubator programs, as we already see in Pajaro CDC, Community Development Corporation, they actually have a small business center for small business owners so that they don't have to pay exorbitant rents. There's a small space they provide. And once they kind of up and running, they're able to move into a larger commercial space. Um, or we look at ALBA. Uh, it's a small agricultural farmers program where they teach them the trade. They teach them issues of, of pesticide use and, and other regulations around food safety. Um, they, they rent out small plots of land for a very low cost. I think it's those kind of models that we need to look at in terms of, of, of trying to uh, provide opportunities for small growers and cultivators or people trying to get into the cannabis industry where I think that's, that's um, I think we need to start there with, with an assumption that not everybody has instant knowledge of what, what it takes to be successful in the cannabis industry. The other thing that I would see is that there needs to be, I think, an, an equity program uh, training opportunities to help people just starting in the industry to be able to move up into more senior positions and marketing on, on uh, product safety. There, there's, there's other opportunities where we could train individuals so that they can move up the ladder, not just be those who are trimming, but could be doing other aspects of this industry that are better paying, that will help them become leaders in the industry as well. So those are the things I want to see when I when I hear of other programs like hey, giving up money for capital or rents or I mean, those are very expensive programs. And 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 just when I became a supervisor of, um, in 2017, the people who were the early um, investors are no longer around or, or they're no longer the owners of the cannabis company. That just in the last four or five years, so I, I've been able to personally see the, the change in ownership or people who, who came into the industry are no longer around and they were experienced in agriculture and other types of businesses. So, so I, 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 wanna, I wanna just recognize the difficulty. It is not only, it's not, it's not, new, it's not um, unique to cannabis, but it's unique to every other kind of business we have in our county. But I want us to start uh, with some real kind of goals and, and, and programs that would help people acquire the knowledge and the training to be able to be successful and then move up in the industry. I certainly, I hope that our program would also um, look at making sure that those hired in the industry really reflect the people of Monterey County. And when I was um, in Sacramento before coming here, um, th there would be early investors who would say when they go to their, their cannabis conferences in Las Vegas or other parts of the country, um, it did, definitely did not look like the demographics of California. So um, when I look at a program in Monterey County, I wanna make sure that the industry embraces um, the diversity uh, to provide at all levels of the industry to be able to pr make sure that the people of Monterey County have those opportunities to move in and pr be successful and, be, and prosper from this new industry that we have in our county. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Alejo. Uh, Supervisor Adams. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as I was thinking about this and listening in to the report, I was thinking that this really goes hand in glove in some ways with our economic develop economic opportunity development uh, approach because of the um, opportunities that we have in things like research and development. It isn't just the farming side, but I think that there's another side of, of cannabis that we could really help uh, look at, which could be very good, good business development for Monterey County itself. And then secondly, this is a little off the rec off the uh, the rails maybe, but I was just wondering if we've ever had any connection or contact with the parole boards as far as looking at people, um, as far as trying to, to get to the people who actually could benefit from this, people who are um, who would qualify for the equity issues that we're talking about, people of color specifically, um, who have been damaged by the, the, the whole war on drugs, et cetera, and maybe that is a harder to reach community, but it, there may be an, an obvious uh, entrance to us that we've not thought to pursue. Thanks. Supervisor Phillips. Yeah, I, mean, I, I guess I just have a little, I, I have concerns about equity generally, but having, and there's a lot of things where I think we need to focus on equity, but 
uh, uh, focusing now on uh, how we get um, some some people who were involved in the marijuana trade back then in into the marijuana business and, and trying to do that other than if we're reaching out to minorities you, you know we ought to be trying to get the minorities um, uh, involved in businesses generally but sticking out marijuana business in particular i can see saying we'll help you if you want to get in this business uh, in, in the permitting process in uh, and to to wipe out your previous conviction so you can compete in, in this business um but uh as, as supervisor aleo points out it, it's uh, uh like any other business uh, i used to Way back when I uh, uh, when I was in a private firm, we represented restaurants and the, the, the mortality of restaurants uh, was was amazing when you really went and looked at it. Everybody said, gee, I like to cook at home. I want to do that same way with growing marijuana. Uh, and and it's a tough industry. And what what have we been hearing for the last months now? We're overproducing marijuana and they want us to lower the rates and give all kinds of things because there's too much on the market. And now uh, encouraging someone to get in that business, um, it's a tough market to get into. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I got hit with uh, in Pottero where they were going to open up a dispensary and I got hit with the people and why are you letting them open up a dispensary in a disadvantaged community, <laughs> you know, so it comes to come away. But I, I, I got to say, I, I would not support any county money going into uh, uh, this program because I, I, I just don't see the worth of it other than trying to open up and expedite if we get people's convictions eradicated so they can qualify on it. So. Thank you, Supervisor Phillips. Um, and that actually was another question that I had was um, our staff report speaks to um, the finance uh, not showing that there wasn't a specific request for, for funding for this, but in the presentation, it does have on item number five, identify a county funding source and commitment um, amount for an equity program. So um, I guess I, at some point we could get clarification on that, but let's take it out to public comment. Um, so this is public comment that we're calling for um, item number 14, which is uh, receiving the findings of the cannabis equity assessment and giving direction. Uh, we have a minute 30 on the clock for um, public comment. And I see Jenny McAdams first. Okay, we'll go to Karen uh, Nordstrand. Karen, we have a minute 30 on the clock for you. Thank you for joining us today. You will have to unmute yourself though, so that we can hear you. This is Karen. I am so sorry. I must have hit the wrong button with three phone calls going, but I, I'm not uh, commenting. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, we'll move along to Oliver Bates. Um, hello, can you hear me? We can. We've got a minute 30 on the clock. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. This is Oliver Bates of the Big Sur Farmers Association. And I uh, would like to express uh, appreciation for all the hard work that went into this equities needs assessment. And uh, as always, we are blown away by Joanne Alamoda's organization and um, Enrique Ignacia and Jessica's presentation. Um, we only ask that um, outdoor pilot program, um, small businesses uh, be considered as well and perhaps regions considered as well. Many of us would like to argue we are still in the war on drugs, um, but I don't want to go down that path. I really like the presentation. We agree with everything. We'd like to put a emphasis on a relocation program and um, mostly due to fires, floods, um, and uh, regulations really uh, being hard to meet, um, finding appropriate properties would really bolster that. Um, but all in all, I uh, really agree with all of your comments and, and uh, Supervisor Alejo um, and, um, and, and um, Chair um, 
Root ask you. We really appreciate and support everything um, you're saying. And um, just in, in, in a final um, note, uh, I think it's important to know that there's a caveat to this program um, around provisional licensing that extends the period of applicants for years beyond the soon closing dates. Um, thank you. Thank you for your comments. I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, we'll move on to um, Harmony. Hello. We have a minute 30 on the clock. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Harmony D'Angelo. Um, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. I uh, really appreciate all the work that went into that and I think they did a great job on findings. Um, you know, we're talking about kind of a combination here of racial equity and social equity and social equity applying to geographic regions, um, particularly left behind in the ordinance when it did go legal. Um, a lot of areas that have climates in the foothills and mountains that Salinas Valley didn't have and a lot of small farms and businesses that um, were forced to shut down due to those um, original ordinances that were passed. So nice to see the progress we've made, really appreciate it, everybody. Um, I think addressing common barriers through co-ops and education outreach programs would be great. Um, grassroots effort coming through the different small community organizations to let people know that these money and grants are available, that um, the state is put aside. I know there's a 10% administrative allowance as well for the county for some of the programs they may want to be implementing. So um, say they address, give us 2 million in this equity grant, there could be 10% they can use for administrative um, issues. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for your comments today. Next up, we have Bernie. Yeah, uh, good afternoon once again, Chair and Board of Supervisors. Uh, I think just listening to the, so first and foremost, thank you for this presentation. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the historical, you know, walkthrough. Uh, I think myself uh, being a recipient of the, uh, being criminalized for marijuana, uh, right? And, and when I was uh, uh, in that in that avenue, right? Um, it's, uh, it's not just the, you know, the marijuana part, it's like it opens up a whole new agenda to the system, right? Like you very intimate, you know, relationship with that, trying to get out of that. Uh, the only thing that, I do appreciate, you know, uh, Chair, for you stating, you know, where was the uh, those that were directly impacted, formerly incarcerated? Where, where was that voice? Uh, and I think when we talk about equity, just like the previous uh, speaker said, you know, we really got to mention or dot down the racial part of equity, you know, because it gets really uh, it, people can maneuver that, right? They, you know, it, it just, and this is what a prime example of what just happened. Equity program, meaning like okay, well we're gonna target the, the the those that are growing already and find equity in there, right? And again, we're, uh, communities of color are being uh, uh, left out. But uh, just looking at pathways for those that have been formerly incarcerated, uh, people of color to engage that want to engage, and I'm sure they're out there, but they're just distrustful. So, Milpa uh, or also want to collaborate with uh, with this. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you, Bernie. Um, next up, we have uh, Ricardo. Hi, thank you, uh, Chair, for hearing me again. I, I don't know much about this. I've been uh, really interested about everything that's uh, uh, been said. Um, uh, I myself am, am uh, Latin, uh, not minority, Mexican. And uh, I was, uh, marijuana kind of ruined my life, you know, as a, as a teen and a young adult. And I got arrested in 1999 in Prunedale and uh, I did a year in jail and I had probation for five years and I went to prison for in 2003, completed my time and did years, three years of uh, parole with no violations because, you know, prison is a scary place and I haven't committed a crime since. You guys heard my voices on here lots in the past 18 years. I mean, I've been the same person throughout the whole time and just those choices when I was young was just, you know, wrong knowingly you know breaking the law but um uh, I, I 
I still want to learn more information about this. This sounds great. Um, um, there, but there is a lot of experienced people out there that are not even getting able to, you know, uh, grow legally, you know, like in the capacity that they want to. They're very experienced, thousands of people, uh, if not. And um, um, that's pretty much all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comments today. Um, next up, we have a phone number ending in 769. And you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. It's a phone number ending in 769. Uh, hi, uh, this is Jack. Um, I'm just calling in. I, I wanted to echo uh, what Oliver said earlier and uh, Harmony and, and the other gentleman uh, that was talking before me. Um, and I guess when we talk about equity and the government's place and sort of wronging these rights and being the arbiter of, of um, what's going to make us all equal again and, and have that be the approach when we're not really addressing what the root of the problem is, which is the drug war itself, and this idea that the government is going to make us better people through force or solve the ills of society by punishing people for their addictions, I think is the wrong approach and it's the wrong policy. And I think if we change the policy and we started thinking about people in a, a more humane way where we're gonna help them, rather than thinking whatever this uh, substance is, it's wrong, it's bad, we should punish these people or get this off the street and, and really sort of ignoring this idea that prohibition doesn't work and it doesn't really help anyone. And, and usually it creates crime or it creates where all these people that really haven't hurt anyone that are doing something that is arguably even good for them, uh, or maybe it's a stress relief, or maybe it's their own business. Um, uh, I, I think that we need to, to re-examine how we view government. And, uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you for all the work you've done uh, thus far on this. Uh, I do appreciate it. We're out of time. Thank you for your Thank comments. You. Um, you're always welcome to contact the board and send additional thoughts to us at cob at co.monterey.ca.us. Um, I don't see any additional hands raised and we uh, don't have anyone here in the audience approaching the podium. So I will um, bring it back to um, this board for uh, action. And we do have some staff recommendations here. Um, Joanne, were there specific, uh, it says that in, under the providing direction is appropriate to staff. Is there anything specifically that you're looking for in the way of direction? Okay, so we'll bring it back to my colleagues um, to receive um, this report, approve the proposed development and implementation, um, and direct the cannabis uh, program manager to develop an equity program structure um, and to apply for a state of California GoBiz tier two grant. And I'm assuming we need a motion to- I'm happy to make that motion, Madam Chair. I just have a, a question. I do see if we could bring bring back up the slide with the series of recommendations on it. Oh, it's Mr. Etchnick, if you can help me out with that. Uh, they yes, were kind of the, the different green tabs there. There you go, blue, perhaps. My only, can, my only question is number three. Um, I did champion that and bring it forward to the board and we shot it down. So I'm just, if, if we're not, if we this board has not moved, it's just kind of curious to me that we're going to revisit that and spend staff time on it. Um, so just, you know, wanted to call that out as making sure we don't spend time on something the board is not going to support in the end. It's just a concern for me in terms of focus and time. Supervisor Alejo. No, just to that point, I would just say it's a, certainly a revisit as it says, states there, but certainly I think um, uh, perhaps there's there's a, a different consideration or perspective on it in light of, of this discussion of an equity program. I, I, I don't think it, would, the, 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 it was with that lens when, when Chris first brought this to the full board and to the cannabis committee. So I, I know I'm, I, I'd be open just to re-looking re that, looking that at that once more. Um, so I, I'm supportive of all, all, of all these, but um, I did want to just get clarity from Joanne. Joanne, that 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 next equity grant. I know we originally got a grant, and that was just to do the planning and 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 pay for some of the work that CSU and B did. This other grant that we'd be applying for is for how much? 
the the amount has not been uh, determined yet. But just to let you know, 80% of the grant that is awarded, if the county does is awarded a grant, needs to be focused to grants or loans, and it assists the county in creating a revolving loan program should they wish. Okay, yeah, I, I'm 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 definitely open to a, a loan program because then the those who are taking out the loan have stake in the game, right? Versus grants. Um, you know, there's there's less of an incentive to make sure that they, they're going to be successful as as a as a potential small business. But but you had conversations with the new uh, cannabis director uh, before the three there were three state agencies. They got recently consolidated into one, and the governor about a couple of months ago appointed a new director of that consolidated cannabis program. And you had conversations with her. Could you explain kind of what the discussions were and kind of the emphasis there was on, on, on implementing the cannabis program in Monterey County? So in speaking to Ms. Elliott, it was actually related to the local assistance grant that the county will be applying for as well. And that is to assist um, our current applicants with the permit processing. So that was at that time. But during that conversation, we also discussed AB 160 and the provisional licenses. And with an equity program in place, and if we have identified equity applicants, those applicants are actually given a longer period of time to um, gain approval of, the, of their annual license. So the provisional license could be renewed <clears throat> or extended longer than next June. 2022. And that would be an advantage specifically for certain groups um, that might qualify um, as uh, as an equity ap applicant. Okay. Th thank you for that. And, and, there, and I'm just going back to this point about uh, people uh, applying, you know, for, for licenses. Um, and, and I, like I said, many of the businesses have had outside investors come in because you need a lot of upfront capital that I, I would just suggest, you know, in terms, just like every other business that, that we explore perhaps maybe with Pajaro City City to create a small incubator cannabis program. They already have the, the business uh, um, park model, but they also have had the, the, the kitchen incubators. They have one in, in uh, Watsonville and they, they will open soon one in East Salinas not to mention the Women's Business Center, but in those incubator programs, there is a training component to create a small business plan and to learn the different aspects of just having a successful business that they, that might be something they might explore to actually uh, create perhaps a first um, small incubator program on the Central Coast that might be able to um, be able to draw down additional grant dollars and perhaps serve multiple counties with some kind of structured program that I think is going to be necessary if we really want um, any applicants, small applicants, to be able to be successful in their business in this industry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say on that last point, uh, maybe a good idea here is to to have uh, Joanne and, and, and folks work with our new uh, economic development uh, director who's just come on board and who we'll be introducing in a few minutes. Um, that might be a good way to, to address what Supervisor Leo is uh, focusing on as, you know, as far as the broader picture of um, you know, uh, encouraging some incubator type of programs. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so with that, do we, did I hear a motion? I didn't write it. Yeah, down. Lopez had a motion. Okay. Alejo had a second. Okay, yeah. perfect. We have a thank you, Supervisor Lopez. Uh, we have a motion from uh, Supervisor Lopez and a second from Supervisor Alejo to um, adopt the staff recommendations um, here today on our staff report. And we'll we already did public comments, so we will take a roll call vote. Thank you, Supervisor Alejo. Aye. Supervisor Phillips. Aye. Supervisor Lopez. Aye. Supervisor Adams? Aye. And Chair Supervisor Root ask you. Aye, thank you. This motion uh, carries. And thank you again to our um, team uh, at uh, uh, CSUMB who uh, supported us uh, with, the, um, with the assessment and the presentation today. Thank you. Okay. 
Moving right along, we've already done item number 15. We are moving to item number 16. Um, Charles McKee, we have County Administrative Officer Comments and Referrals. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on here. So the uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We have one new referral this week from uh, Supervisor Phillips, which is to refine the noise noise ordinance with improved processes through the lessons learned. And what, uh, uh, in particular, looking at some of the issues such as uh, enforcement before 9 p.m. and on weekends, and if there are any other tools that that we could uh, uh, have code enforcement or others at their disposal to. Um, make some refinements to the noise ordinance to make it more effective. And so we'd be happy to um, ask our housing and community development uh, as well as assistance from county council to uh, work on work on updates to the um, uh, noise ordinance. Uh, in addition, we have, I just wanna note in our, in our matrix, we've um, updated the referrals to reflect the comments from last week from the board on um, modifying some of the referrals. So those, that modification language is included Included in your matrix. And uh, so that's that's all for referrals this week. And as far as comments, I don't have any additional comments this week, except for I did want to introduce our new economic development manager, Richard Vaughn. And I have uh, Dwayne Woods should be on the Zoom here to make a few comments. And then Mr. Vaughn is here in the audience and, and he might uh, say hello also. Dwayne? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dwayne Woods with the County Administrative Office. Um, I wanted the board uh, to introduce the board. Our new economic development manager, uh, Richard Vaughn, he comes to us from the County of San Bernardino. Uh, and he comes with us with uh, some extensive experience and a real focus in economic development. Uh, we searched far and wide and long. Uh, it was a long, arduous process to find somebody. And I must say that uh, of all, I'm very, very happy to introduce uh, Richard as uh, our new uh, economic development manager, and uh, I'm looking forward to great things and uh, really reinvigorating our economic development uh, commu uh, committee and uh, getting some um, real good progress going forward uh, coming out of this pandemic. So uh, I'm not sure if Richard's uh, there, if he wants to say a few words or the board may have any questions. Great. Welcome, uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we'd love to uh, have you uh, do a brief introduction and um, no we'll let you well, take the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, good afternoon, Chair uh, Rudis Q and Board of Supervisors. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, I'm very excited and honored to be the new Economic Development Manager for Monterey County. I'm excited to go ahead and get started on my work here and looking forward to meeting with all of your offices and working with you all uh, on economic development throughout uh, the entire Monterey County. So. Uh, any questions you have for me, feel free. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. And um, I know that on behalf of my colleagues, we are we're so grateful to have you on board. Um, it was a long, uh, a long search, and um, we are um, we've got a lot of work to do. So we uh, we all, I think, uh, I can speak for all of us. Look forward to um, the opportunity to get to know you and to um, uh, introduce you to all of the wonderful different parts of our county. Uh, so we will um, we will wait to, to to meet with you in person. All right. Thank I look you. forward to it. All right. Is there any public comment on our CAO comments today. I don't see any hands raised. So we will close public comment on the CAO comments and bring it over to our board comments. Um, we will start online. Supervisor Lopez, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll just I'll keep it short. It's been a been a long day. I just want to, you know, share that this weekend, Saturday, we will be finally honoring the 2020 citizens of the year in King City. And so I wanna congratulate all those winners. We did pass resolutions honoring those folks uh, last week, but with that coming up this weekend, just wanted to give them an extra shout out with citizen of the year, Steve Adams and the others on the list. It's, uh, it's an exciting time to be able to gather a little bit and share, share uh, all those accolades for those who've done a lot for our communities in the last year. And with that, I'll wrap my comments, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lopez. Um, Supervisor Alejo. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I first of all would um, want to just say that this Monday our nation celebrates Labor Day, and I wanted to just uh, extend my gratitude to all our, our over 5,400 county employees and thank them for 
for all they do for Monterey County, especially during this last year and a half during the pandemic. And certainly to all the other workers in, in Monterey County that, that keep our economy going strong and really being on the front line despite challenging times. And just a, a moment to reflect on all the, the labor protections we have today. They didn't happen by chance. They happened because people fought to institute these rights and protections for, for workers in California. And California has the, the strongest, I think, out of any state in the nation, including those for our agricultural workers. Um, I also wanted to just uh, um, give props to our county residents. I think as of yesterday, 22% of our residents have uh, sent in their ballots for the special election on September 14th. That is higher than the state average, which I think is right now at 17%. So I just wanna encourage the people to keep exercising their fundamental right to vote and to send in their ballots by September 14th. There's a lot on this line, a lot on the line on this election for the, for the future of California. And uh, it, doing something that takes a couple of minutes of your precious time uh, will really make a big change um, um, on September 14th. So uh, that, I just wanted to say that. Lastly, I know we're a journey in memory, but uh, certainly as a son of a Vietnam era ver veteran, I wanted to just express my condolences to the 13 veterans, um, 12 Marines, one Navy, um, 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 officer who, who uh, was killed in action in Afghanistan. And I know our nation mourned um, their losses and I know the lives of their children and their spouses and their families are changed forever. Uh, but I, I wanted us, I, Monterey County has always been a community that really supports veterans and, and knows the sacrifice that, that is paid and the pain that is felt when you lose a loved one. So I just, uh, on, as, on behalf of our board, I, I just wanted to um, just express that and uh, I'm glad that we're journeying in their memory today and knowing that it's a, certainly a tremendous loss for a nation losing any of our soldiers um, killed in action. Uh, so um, I, my prayers to their families their, and their friends. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Alejo. Uh, Supervisor Phillips. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just a uh, few things I, I might point out and brag a little bit. I see that uh, uh, Aromas, it's got 2,500, has a 100% vaccination rate. Moss Landing, who has a population of 54, has a 97% uh, uh, vaccination rate. So I want to brag about my uh, communities a little bit. Uh, but uh, I got to say, since we've... Uh, uh, since we opened our schools up, we've seen uh, a surge uh, in uh, infection to, from the COVID. Uh, and to that, uh, you remember that uh, the health department uh, couldn't keep the uh, testing open in Castorville like we had. But I talked to Kim Stemmler today, and the, she's bringing out the Vita uh, people for a couple of days uh, uh, to assist us on that. Uh, on our, I uh, wanted to comment on my um, referral on the noise ordinance. Uh, uh, you know, we've had our ordinance in place for a couple years, and uh, and admittedly, the sheriff will tell you it's a difficult thing, and it's not their top priority. So I, I understand that, but uh, we just haven't been um, very effective in in dealing with the noise. Uh, and I, uh, I in the county uh, have heard from our residents, and so. Uh, uh, the last time we did this, we we took and reworked the ordinance that we had, and I, I'm not so sure that it wouldn't be the best thing to look at it with fresh eyes uh, and be more direct. And, and I have provided uh, to county council uh, uh, with some ordinances from other jurisdictions that have been provided by the citizens because they, they've done their own investigation, pretty effective, I, I might say. And uh, they've looked at, you know, we're looking at maybe uh, something more direct, no amplified music after seven o'clock without a permit, uh, uh, using an administrative citation uh, that may be easier to enforce than, than what we have now. With code enforcement, uh, I, I know Mr. McKee and I have talked to the code enforcement people about maybe having a code enforcement person on duty uh, and working on weekends when 95% of the problems occurred. Uh, 
And uh, I've discussed with the mayor and the sheriff and some others about drone enforcement that uh, that the, the city of Salinas is doing. And I've talked to the sheriff about using their drone capability or for a minor investment, uh, maybe getting that capability to our uh, code enforcement people. So uh, I, I wanted to explain a little bit of what we're looking because right now the the, the loud parties uh, are are still continuing into the late late nights uh, i had one what really kind of pushed me into it uh, a, a week a week and a half ago i was going to two funeral services uh, a matter of fact and i saw the big tent set up at 10:30 in the morning i called that in we apparently got out there uh, and told the people that they were illegal to have the tent and about the things that they couldn't couldn't do. Uh, and so then when I came home at 1030 that night, uh, there was a raging party going on at that location. And so uh, uh, that's what the, kind of was the final straw of me saying, OK, well, we got to do something. So thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to brag for all of us. I was privileged to help MC last week's Monterey Peninsula Chamber of Commerce's 20, uh, 34th Annual Business Excellence Awards event. And the highlight of the evening for me was that Monterey County's own WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca was selected as the winner of the Art, Attractions, Entertainment, Event Services, and Recreation category. Um, Laguna Seca will now move forward with the winners of the other categories to the final award event um, of Business of the Year, which will be held in the spring of this year. It truly made me feel very, very proud to be able to hand them that award. I was saddened to hear that the Santa Rosalia Festival, also called the, the Fiesta de Taya, has been postponed to next year because of concerns over COVID. My heart goes out to the many people who really, uh, in our community, who look at that event as their sort of annual community and family reunion. A couple of meetings coming up uh, for District 5 residents over the next uh, few weeks is, um, first, we have the, the uh, next meeting of the Big Sur Byway Organization that will be on September 7th at 9 o'clock. And on September 9th, from 5.30 to 7, I'm going to be holding a community um, uh, meeting for residents to further discuss options for the long-term flooding hazard risk uh, uh, reduction activities in the vicinity, vicinity of the Carmel Lagoon. As you know, this was a horrendous issue this year. The meeting will be held via Zoom. So please contact my office for um, additional information on any of these meetings. And then um, thank you, Luis, for reminding everyone to vote by September uh, 14th. Our participation is so critical in maintaining our democracy. Um, I also want to mention, if you haven't heard it, that all U.S. forests are going to be closed effective today. So there will be no camping or um, recreating at all in any of the U.S. forests here in the state of California due to the massive fire issues that we face. So thank you so much. Thank you all. I don't have any comments uh, today, so I will um, just say thank you all uh, for um, the, the meeting and for indulging um, uh, our, all the, the public participation and public comment, which I think is a valuable addition to our decision making. Um, I would uh, like to ask our county council to read out uh, closed session items from the Monterey County Board of Supervisors and the Monterey County Water Resources Agency. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Members of the board, there were no reportable actions today. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, and for adjournment today, as I mentioned earlier, I've invited uh, our military and veterans affairs officer, Jason Cameron, uh, to uh, join us and make some comments um, and adjournment, um, recognizing and, and honoring the lives of the um, 2,461 US service members um, and civilians who've been killed um, in Afghanistan, um, uh, including the 13, uh, the most recent 13 US service members who were killed last week. Um, Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think given the comments this morning and the comments um, from my colleagues uh, in comments uh, and, and closing comments tonight, um, you know, our, mil our military history in Monterey County is rich and our uh, commitment to honoring um, our service members and supporting their families uh, runs deep. And uh, thank you so much for being here to uh, make a few comments for us as we adjourn in memory. Absolutely. Thank you uh, so much, Chair Root, SQ, and the full board uh, for the adjournment in memory of our service members who have lost their lives in the Afghanistan war. Again, my name is Jason Cameron. I'm the Military and Veterans Affairs Officer for the County of Monterey. I'm a United States Marine Corps veteran, and I also served another six years with the Army National Guard. You know, less than a week ago, on Thursday, August 26th, 
An attack outside the International Airport of Kabul, Afghanistan, killed the 13 U.S. service members supporting Operation Freedom Sentinel. This brings us to the total of, as Chair Root Askew stated, 2,461 service members who have lost their lives in Afghanistan. Each one of them stood with their right hand raised and swore to protect our great nation. They signed a blank check, payable up to death, and selflessly served. They were sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, fathers, and mothers. Some never got to see their newborn children. Some never got to see the first, the first steps of their child. But these heroes have saved countless lives, even in the last hours. 11 days ago, on August 20th, U.S. Marine Corps Sergeant Nicole Gee was photographed as she calmed an infant during uh, the evacuation at the International Airport in Kabul, undoubtedly saving that child's life. She loved her job. She loved helping those in need. She loved being a part of something bigger than herself. Sergeant Gee was one of the Marines killed in Thursday's bombing at the airport. The stories of these heroes do not end with flag draped caskets, but rather are to be memorialized and live on through their families and communities such as ours, the County of Monterey. Thank you again for closing in memory of our service members who lost their lives in the Afghanistan war. And I appreciate the support from this great board of supervisors who are so supportive of every single service member who ever served and, and who live here and across this nation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. And with that, we are adjourned. Good job, Jason. Thank you, sir. Those words.